take it away, Carolyn. Okay, thank you very much, Faileen, and thanks for people coming out on a Saturday evening. So um, as you're probably aware, at least in Canada and many places in, uh, in, in North America, there are many, many uh, celebrations, events, et cetera, to mark International Women's Day. And they range from uh, things in high schools, on campuses, university college campuses, corporate headquarters of many of, uh, you know, you can see Bell Canada and the CIBC Bank and all kinds of groupings that uh, put together events for International Women's Day. And they bring many different perspectives. And uh, you're probably all familiar. And I guess what we, I want to talk about, and I think we uh, who put the meeting on tonight wants to talk about is the uh, roots of, uh, of International Women's Day and the uh, working class roots, our class as members of uh, the Revolutionary Socialist Organization. And I, I think everyone uh, obviously is aware that uh, women have worked since the beginning of time. Women have always worked, whether it be hunter gatherer societies or uh, on uh, a peasant farm, or, you know, all throughout the, uh, the, uh, the, the history of the world, frankly. And uh, they worked in economic production, but also sustained uh, children, sustained families, the elderly, et cetera, the double day of work as uh, it's sometimes called. But I want to talk about particularly the role of women uh, in the workplace since the Industrial Revolution. And uh, women, uh, because of the changes that were taking place there, and we can talk about a little bit more in the discussion period, were uh, coming from many of the rural areas into the cities, their labor was needed to work in the huge uh, factories that were being developed as uh, capitalism was expanding. And um, they were exploited as workers, they were oppressed as women. And I, I'm gonna concentrate a little bit on North America and what happened, uh, what happened there. And uh, if we look at the, uh, the era of the industrial uh, revolution, uh, we know that slave owners in the southern states and the Caribbean and many places in the Americas uh, on huge plantations uh, where both women and men worked were horrifically uh, exploited, treated with, uh, with, uh, without any dignity and, uh, replace, and respect in horrific conditions. And uh, they produced, uh, if you look at the southern United States and the Carolinas, a lot of rice, it was cane. But the vast majority of the southern states were producing cotton. They were producing that for the huge mills that had developed in the northern United States, in the UK, et cetera. And uh, I was at a uh, museum in Massachusetts, Lowell Lawrence. I'll speak about Lowell and Lawrence, which had many, many mills. And they had a national park, interestingly, uh, uh, exposition there. And it talked about the lash and the loom, the lash in the southern states where women struggled, men struggled under horrific conditions and the loom where they took that raw material, the cotton and made it into products to sell and created huge, huge wealth. They were being exploited. They were being oppressed racially because of their, uh, their gender. And uh, you had a situation where uh, these mills brought many, many, many women together because it was for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, women workers there. And uh, as time went on, there were large, large waves of immigration that took place uh, from Europe or from other places as well. And uh, they brought women and women uh, who may have never worked before in an industrial setting were brought in to these huge mills and they were huge. I mean, the small, mill that I, I think, Michelle, you might have been, this was the United Steelworker trip that we took one time to support a strike action uh, that was happening here, Crown Products, and we were going to uh, areas in the, in the States to build solidarity. And uh, the noise was extraordinary, the conditions, very tight working conditions. And the first people who came in to work in those were what they called farm girls from Northern New England, if it was Massachusetts, from, from rural areas. And they were housed in uh, barracks, as it were, dormitories. And uh, they faced difficult conditions. But as I say, with these mass waves of immigration, women came from every country in Europe, absolutely. And, uh, and so they were producing it. And they were producing the, the, the product, but the product then had to become a, uh, a garment of some sort. So garment 
garment factories sprang up all over the United States as well. And one area where they were particularly prominent was in New York City, Lower East Side, Greenwich Village. And uh, they, uh, there were many, many, many of them, tens of thousands of, uh, of mostly immigrant women worked in these. And again, under very bad conditions, uh, very little dignity and respect, low wages, uh, and uh, very, very, very hard times and uh, long days. And uh, this was a time in which there was a lot of socialist agitating that was going on. Socialism was on the agenda in many areas around the world and certainly in the United States. And as time went on, these women, many of them exposed to socialist ideas, many of them coming from countries where socialist ideas were, were quite prominent. And they made the decision that they had had enough. In 1908, on March 8th, as it turns out, which we now celebrate as International Women's Day, 15,000 marched. And they marched both for political reasons, they wanted the vote, but they also marched for economic reasons, the conditions that they were working under. And a short while later, in 1909, over three months, there was a whole series of strikes where women were attempting to organize themselves in the workplaces. They were coming out, uh, walkouts, et cetera. And it was very, very tough slogging because they did not have union, uh, union um, protection. And uh, something that's really gone down in history was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. That took place in 1910. And you know what's happened in Bangladesh with the collapse of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of textile factories over there. Well, this was not so terribly different. Uh, it was a situation in which a fire broke out on the eighth, ninth, and 10th floors of a, of a, of a, of a, a multi-story building. And in the end, 78 died. It was the largest uh, uh, workplace uh, death toll that had ever happened in the United States. And uh, another uh, 46 or something like that were severely injured. And it was, it, they couldn't leave. The, the doors were locked, the stairs were locked to prevent pilfery, to prevent people taking unwarranted breaks on the, uh, on the, uh, on the fire escapes. And they could not get out. Many of them could not get out. They were jumping. They died of uh, an eight, nine, tenth floors. They were jumping to their deaths. They died of smoke inhalation, of burns. And it, it was a huge uh, uh, catastrophe, disaster, any way you want to put it. And it led, frankly, to the beginnings of unions like the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, et cetera. And um, this, uh, this was the scene that was set. And it was, this was New York City. But it was, it was the same many, many, many other places, both in Europe and in, uh, in North America, and I'm sure Canada as well. And uh, socialist women gathered a short time later in 1910 for a conference, a working women's conference in Copenhagen. And Clara Zetkin, who was a revolutionary socialist and others, felt it was hugely important to, uh, to put uh, the, the lives and the, the sacrifices and the on, uh, of those who died, certainly, but of those who are ongoing and fighting the battle there, and to declare, as she said, a special Women's Day, a working Women's Day, but it came to be, and if you read Alexander Kolontai and other uh, Bolshevik uh, women, you can see International Women's Day was becoming something with spread. 1911 was the very first, years gone by, gone by places like Germany and, uh, and uh, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, a whole range of other European countries were beginning to celebrate International Women's Day. And uh, in, in the United States, again, uh, Lawrence and Lowell, I had mentioned having gone to that uh, factory that was, you know, had the machines whirring and all that, giving you a, a sense of what it was like, and though you were there only for a short time. There were tens of thousands of women from 22 different countries working in these mills. And uh, their wealthy uh, owners lived in Boston, lived in Lowell and, Ma and Lawrence as well. A huge class of extremely wealthy, wealthy people. And uh, so they, they decided to strike. It was the International Industrial Workers of the World that cho chose to start unionizing there. They chose to strike. And they went factory to factory to factory. And women just walked out, walked out, and walked out. And as I say, 22 different languages uh, spoken. And the American Federation of Labor, which was at that point a union that was primarily for the skilled trades, the craftspeople, et cetera, mostly men, didn't think you could organize immigrant women, certainly from so many different, uh, different backgrounds. And they had essentially ignored it. And that's why the uh, IWW was able to uh, come in and do what they did. And this was absolutely a startling strike. 
It shut down these mills for weeks on end, and it became a cause celebre, if you want, for the progressive movements, the socialist movements, and it, it garnered huge support. The flying squad, this is the first time it was used, going from plant to plant, as I say, gathering more and more women, and they had their supporters as well. But it became such an issue that uh, all kinds of working class households all over Massachusetts and states beyond agreed to take the children of those workers so that women could be able to uh, essentially put their whole energy into the strike. And so the train stations were coming out of, uh, of those towns filled with children and obviously people bringing them to, the, to their, their homes to be taken care of. So there was an incredible solidarity that, was, that developed to support uh, these women. And because of that, and, and it was tough, women died on these strikes. The police were rough. It was it was very, very rough situation. And yet, uh, with the publicity, the strong support, the children going out across uh, across state lines, being taken care of by working class families who wanted them to win because they knew what it meant, uh, you know, and they worked in very, very similar conditions, they were able to win that. They got a huge increase because they had been they had they were having concessions imposed upon them uh, earlier than that the government of Massachusetts was opposed to them all but they won and they won a significant significant battle and it, it the 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 that that battle that that uh, working class uh, women's strike uh, though this of this poem uh, bread and roses which has become sort of the anthem of the women's liberation movement it was actually composed just before but it spoke so much to what those women were fighting for and uh, and the solidarity that they were able to uh, to make you know just breaking <laughs> excuse me the language barriers the cultural barriers all of that and build a strong united force and so bread and roses has since that time become the anthem of the women's liberation movement and it was hugely hugely important and uh, i think so as time goes on and uh, what i'm trying to point out is here is the the clear working class roots to International Women's Day. And uh, socialist women, like I said, Clara Zetkin, et cetera, they continue to fight in their own areas, their own countries for, for change. And uh, in 1917, in Petrograd, there was a revolutionary uh, moment in many senses, turmoil was happening. And uh, on March 8th, in our calendar, they had the Julian calendar, uh, February 23rd in the Julian calendar, uh, women workers began a demonstration in Petrograd, and they were demanding peace and bread and land. They were demanding an end to World War I, and they were demanding better conditions for themselves and the entire working class and the peasantry in what was then Russia. And that marked the beginning of the February Revolution. And any of you who are students of Marxism knows uh, what, what that was all about. That was when the Bolsheviks and, and the working class and the peasantry in Russia rose up and uh, essentially started to create a new world. Now Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, he wrote February 23rd, and in, in the Julian calendar, as I say, March 8th in ours, uh, he, he wrote, March 8th was International Women's Day and meetings and actions were foreseen. This is talking about the Bolshevik party, but we did not imagine that this Women's Day would in, 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 inaugurate the revolution. Revolutionary actions were foreseen, but without a date. They knew they were moving toward a moment, but they didn't think it was yet there. And he goes on to say, but in the morning, despite orders to the contrary, the women textile workers left their work in many factories and sent delegates out to factories all over Petrograd looking for the sport for their strike. And all went out. They went out and it was beginning. It was the beginning of the revolution. And just seven days later, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated. And obviously, again, students of Marxism, 1917, uh, following that came the October Revolution. And uh, after the working people of uh, Russia seized control of the government, started the creation of a new society with childcare centers, legalizing abortion, legalizing homosexuality, making huge, uh, making childcare uh, readily available. And uh, Alexandra Kolontai, who was a, a major woman figure 
in uh, in uh, in that uh, in that revolution and Vladimir Lenin, uh, they uh, then suggested and it became uh, uh, real that International Women's Day would become a uh, an annual holiday that was to celebrate the role of women workers. Now that was a long time ago and a period of time after that where there was strong left organizations and strong mass movements for change that included women and men, International Women's Day was celebrated. But as time went on, it, 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 it lost its popularity, if you want to see, say that. It wasn't happening in the way it had in, for, for quite a while. And I'm going to jump a number of decades. And not that there weren't celebrations, not that there weren't events, but it, 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 did, uh, it, it lost uh, the dynamism and sort of the class content that, uh, that, that, it, that were its roots in essentially. And so I, I want to jump now to Toronto, 1978. Now we all know through the 60s, the early 70s, there were huge movements that were taking place uh, in North America, around the world. There was the uh, Black Power Movement, there was the Lib Women's Liberation Movement, the Gay Liberation Movement, the American Indian Movement, a whole range of movements that were questioning the very basis of the society in which we live. People were viewing revolutionary politics, revolutionary socialist politics, as, as a way forward. They were inspired by the things that had happened in the past. And uh, you know, certainly in the United States, groups like the Black Panther Party or the Young Lords or the Iwakun, which is an Asian American group, uh, groupings in Canada as well. You know, we're seeing that this is a time for change. We're rooted deeply in their communities, fought against the Vietnam War. So there's a tremendous radicalization that was taking place. And the later part to the 70s, when those movements were co-opted, I don't want to say defeated because huge changes did take place. There's no doubt about it. Whole uh, levels of reforms were taking place, but it was a it was movements in process. And some, you know, uh, lost the vim uh, and the the vigor perhaps of of the, of the earlier 60s. There was a tremendous repression. Anyone who saw the Fred Hampton. Uh, film that was out recently, murders were taking place, and, and that type of thing was happening here. I mean, I was in the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement in the 70s, and um, the War Measures Act implemented in Quebec, 500 trade unionists, students, separatists, et cetera, arrested, all your rights taken away, you could be in prison without charge, all of that. Our office was burnt to the ground, frankly, uh, the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement. But it was during those times that, that we, we decided that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the late, uh, in the late 70s, that, uh, and I'm talking a period of time here when the war measures came in and all that, but that it was time to start once again, to getting back to the roots of, of a militant, radical, and working class-based uh, women's liberation movement, and to try once again to uh, to uh, really try and uh, and uh, put put uh, the women's movement on the map again. So later in the seventies, after all that, the War Measures Act was early in the seventies. All of that uh, that I was talking pl uh, taking place, uh, Fred Hampton, the murder, all of that. But in 1978. We felt it was hugely important to do that, and we decided we would. We would try our best to do that. And we called a large meeting. Uh, I was one of a number of people, 10 women initially, who got together. We called, there were, geez, 100 people who came out to the meeting. And the thing is, there were a lot of different debates. Do we have this just as a women's march within what was then the self defined women's movement, or do we broaden it out? Do we ask trade unions to belong? Do we ask immigrant organizations to come out? Do we have brothers? Uh, in, the, in, in the streets with us as we march. Big debate, and it was speaking of really different perspectives on how you build a movement. So that debate was had, it was won, and we decided on a broad-based approach. And what I would say is a united front approach, and, uh, and we moved forward. And it was, a, it was a leap of faith in many senses. Is it gonna work? Is it not gonna work? Hard to say. We did everything we could to organize it because we were trying to really prove a point that we could build a militant fight back. And so we, we, we uh, rented convocation hall that holds about 2000 people or so. And I remember very well that morning, and I can't remember, was it 11 a.m.? Perhaps that's when we called it for. All there, the speakers were there, we were there, nobody else, no audience. And oh my God, we overstretched it this time. Well, it's a good chance. We're all saying, well, you know, it was worth the try. And I remember um, Jess McKenzie, that some of you may know, 
she was in the Revolutionary Workers League, you know, a group in the Fourth International. She came running in the door saying, they're coming, they're coming. And out from the subways and all, uh, people just flowed in, women, men, just from all kinds of communities, trade unions, et cetera. And within a matter of, I would say, 15 minutes, the place was full. And it was, it was just uh, one of the most extraordinary moments, I think, because it just tells you, you know, you've got to have faith. Not that it's always going to happen, not that you're always going to win it, but it was an extremely um, important uh, moment. And uh, we had people speaking on abortion rights, child care, uh, uh, lesbian rights, as they're called then. And uh, uh, the, 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 the cause really that captured the most media and captured was a, a Sharona Hall, who's deceased now, uh, a friend of mine who uh, was a founder of the Black Action Defense Committee, but she was involved in the deportation of Jamaican mothers because the women were, came here to work as domestic workers and they wanted to bring their children up and they hadn't declared their children and, for, and whatever, and they were all being deported. So it was a major, major campaign. So it was these kind of working class issues that we wanted to put together and felt was so, so important to put together and to build, not just for ourselves and for the small coterie of people who we might talk to every day, but for the broader movement, try and get thousands into the streets as we did, try and get the media attention and put real demands on government for change. And that was the basis on which we began that organizing. And it wasn't perfect. It wasn't probably as diverse as it could have been. It wasn't as, uh, uh, you know, you're learning as you go. We were all extremely young, keep in mind, extremely young, uh, but uh, it worked. And the, the coalition has gone through many, many changes but it tried to keep that same anti-racist class analysis class very clear. And uh, the next, mm, next one in 79, that was 78, next one in 79 uh, was the, uh, the, the whole question of, uh, of pure tech strikers, a big strike, a garment factory, interestingly, and uh, they led the march. So we tried to have that type of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of analysis that we wanted uh, to maintain. So the coalition went through many types of uh, uh, permutations, ups and downs as the world, uh, the world moved on. Uh, but as Faylene said at the beginning, we were able to have every year a march and a rally, putting forward, highlighting the key demands of the women's liberation movement in Toronto. And that was important. And whether it be abortion rights at that particular moment, child care or whatever, we tried racism. We tried our best to do that. And as time went on, and we looked at the world around us and we tried to expand, what, what would you call a women's issue? Is a war, is war a women's issue? Well, we felt so. And again, we had to have the debate in the, in the coalition. And uh, when OCA was happening, if people remember back in the early 1990s, you know, indigenous peoples uh, in Quebec, uh, in a real standoff with uh, the the government of Quebec, the Cité de Quebec, and uh, and frankly uh, racists around them, um, we called the uh, main demand. The theme was no uh, uh, no to war from Oka to the Gulf, because indigenous people were seeing it as war. And of course, the Gulf, a huge war that was taking place, and we were trying to be a part of and support the anti-war movement. Uh, for, for all the right reasons. And I think those kind of uh, debates are hugely important. And another example would be uh, in 1986, earlier than the, the, the previous one, uh, no to racism from Toronto to South Africa, when the whole uh, anti-apartheid movement was, was, was so strong in South Africa, there was a huge movement for change. And of course, confronting at the same time the racism that we see here in Toronto. So it was those kind of uh, uh, politics and you know, when I spoke earlier about forming a united front, I mean, as revolutionary socialists, uh, we, we, we don't try and put forward our absolute maximum program. What we try and do is build a grouping of people, many of whom may not be revolutionary socialists, particularly maybe in the NDP, maybe not as left as we may see ourselves be, but we can maintain our own politics, maintain our own identity, but we try and bring demands forward that a large swath of people could feel and organizations could feel they will fight for and they will win. I mean, it's the way we managed to uh, 
to fight for abortion rights in this in this country, for example. And I think International Women's Day is a really good example of how you can build the united front, you can build real comradeship between the people that you are amongst the people you're in struggle with, and a trust and an ability to bring in all kinds of communities and make a huge difference. And I will say for many, many years, Feline spoke of it earlier in her introduction, we've been in the streets. Last two years, we were not in the streets uh, because of COVID. But usually, the International Women's Day marches are the most diverse marches in the city. And that's been the case for quite a long time. And some examples of what we've taken up when there was a uh, an organizing drive at Eaton's, a very strong, hard fought drive, we uh, we marched down. We marched by Eaton's, and our plan was, and we did it. The marshals just suddenly ran off, opened the doors, pushed away the security guards, and the whole march went right through the Eaton Center. It was just an extraordinary moment. And interestingly, the only one who got arrested was Cliff Pilkey, who was at the time the uh, president of the Ontario Federation of Labor. I don't know what he did. Was he shoplifting? I have no idea. He was the only one who was arrested. And uh, again, it brought a huge boost to that organizing drive. Another time when the Delta Hotel was in a very tough fight of really pushing down on their workers who are members of what the union now is called Unite Here. And uh, same thing happened. I, I don't know, Terry, if it was you and me who were driving the truck, but we we're going forward, we're leading the march, we go by the Delta Hotel, the police are all right around us in the truck, and the truck, the plan was, we just keep on going. So the police just kept on going with us, but the march just veered off and went right into the hotel. So it was, you know, it, it, it was just the, I, mean, I can still see the cops suddenly looking around realizing, what? We don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. What happened? Okay. So, but these these types of activity, which just give, I think, allow people to be inspired that you know what, as bad as things can be and as tough as they can be, we have the capacity to make change. And when you look back to the tremendous roots, you know, of um, of International Women's Day, you look back to the strike 1912 and Lawrence and Lowell and the horrific conditions that those women were up against. They couldn't even speak to each other, many of them. And people were dying in that strike. And yet they persevered. They got huge solidarity. Their kids being taken care of by people, you know, like-minded to themselves. And they won. Does it mean you're going to win every time? No, it does not. But what it does mean is you have the capacity to win. If you don't try, you can never win. So I think those types of uh, examples, I think, is what we would want any movement to be. And is every women's movement like it? Not particularly, but you see, you know, in Argentina, the fight for abortion rights, in Ireland, in Poland, uh, so many places, working women, the, 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 uh, the strikes that we're seeing, you know, around the world, you know, it shows that even in the hard times of COVID, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, all of that, people are struggling and they're struggling to win. And you have to keep that optimism that the, the possibility of winning is there, it is within our grasp. And uh, I think it's, it's just something that by concrete example, when you're able to win, and as I say, we're not Pollyannas, we don't think everything we're gonna go into is gonna win, no, for sure. You, you figure it out, you hope you can, you try and broaden it and build it as, 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 as well as you can, but uh, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not a sure thing for all, but you do everything and you try to build it as broad as possible. And that's why the, the, the theory of United Front, which I'm not going into in great detail, but just showing some examples, is the way forward. Everyone isn't going to accept everything a revolutionary socialist has to say, but the thing is, you can get unity on common demands. And as you struggle and you fight through with those common demands, you know what? People can say, "Way well, that, that's a that's what what brought you to that idea?" And you know the analysis you're bringing forward, and 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 you can talk about the need for the fight for reforms, but in truth. We need a whole different system. You know, we need to overturn capitalism. All the exploitation and the oppression is so wrapped up in, in, in the capitalist system that we uh, war everything that we, we see around us. And, you know, whether it's a question of, uh, you know, disability rights or, or gender, sexuality, uh, you know, fighting misogyny, fighting racism, all of these are embedded in the system and there are very real, real uh, uh, forces 
that frankly do not want us to win and they want to divide and rule us right they want to divide and rule us and uh, that's what uh, that's what we have to fight against we have to recognize the differences amongst us of course the sexism racism all of that but we have to build unity and not let those divide us so we become uh, we become uh, frankly powerless that is what they want and we won't allow it to happen and i think that in these last couple of years of COVID, we figure, well, what the heck are we going to do here in Toronto? You know, we, we, we want the spirit of the streets. We want that energy. We want the diversity of, uh, uh, of, uh, of women to be shown in a way that had been historically shown in the streets that have given inspiration to so, so many people. Because right now, particularly, a lot of people are feeling pretty desperate. You know, you can't buy a home you can barely get a rent affordable rental in in this city you you, you know uh many people have lost their jobs they're not coming back it's it's a tough tough time so you want to give people a sense that we have a capacity you know to uh to fight and to win and to hopefully create a new world and uh so last year we did a zoom but it wasn't a zoom of talking heads and we did it again this year because it was so successful last year. And we tried to look and interview rank and file workers, people from the grassroots. You can hear the politicians, you can hear the union leaders anytime, all the time, too much of the time. But what we wanted to show is the women on the ground, the non-binary people, the trans people on the ground who are fighting, fighting, fighting for change. And when you hear what they have to say, you, you can't allow yourself to be inspired because they're fighting on and they're winning some they're losing some so last year you know it was about the covid but you know we're not we're, we're going to come out of the covid stronger the, the pandemic stronger than we went in and this year it was um an interesting discussion but it got us to um people and planet before profit revolutionary love to all and it worked for people. It really worked for people. It gave that sense of revolution, but also recognized people and the planet, you know, giving a tip of the hat to the climate justice movement. And it had women from many races speaking. And, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, from everything that I've heard, people have felt it was a huge success and were, uh, you know, and felt really good about it. So I, I think that um, this is, uh, this certainly talks about our class, the working class, that is hugely diverse, and that we know theoretically we have the collective power to make change. We have the collective power to make huge change. And when you see examples of when that works, people come together, they move forward, and they make gains, then it gives people the hope that we can do it again and again and again and again. So I think I will leave it at that. We can have a lot of time for discussion. And I think we were just going to show, for people who may not have seen it, a little clip from uh, from International Women's Day this year, and you'll you get hopefully a spirit or what the spirit we tried to put forward in a way that uh, that uh, that really uh, gives a sense of uh, of grassroots rank and file fighting back in the best way possible. So if we want to uh, run that little clip and then on to discussion. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. That was pretty inspiring just to hear about the historical roots, but also, you know, specifically what happened or what has happened in Toronto. So we're going to, Michelle, are you going to, are we going to show a clip? She's just getting there. <laughs> but I, as she's doing, oh, there we go. Sound? Hmm. Okay, just one moment. Uh, I have to reload it. And the coalition who organized it, led by women working with immigrant women. But many communities, the Kurdish community, the Filipino community, unions like people from Unifor and SEIU and QP and the Steelworkers and uh, people from the Immigrant Women's Health Center and the uh, um, all kinds of different women's organizations. But they they've come together, you know, and we hash it out and uh, figure out what we want to, uh, you know, put forward. And people always have their own favorites, of course. But it's it's a 
it's a it's a it's a it's a good process. We have to do it in a couple of months, you know, because we start in January and it ends March eighth. So you all set, Michelle. Somebody hmm. else. It is incumbent upon us as women to make sure that things are remolded in our favor. You know, there's snipers on you, there's helicopters flying over, there's attack dogs being held by their leashes ready to go. And I felt like this, this oppression of silence, like, oh, I should run and hide, or I, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble. You know, how are my kids gonna? water I heard the Wenziqua I heard all of the the years hundreds of years of my ancestors saying stand up and a lot of PTSD happened because of this pandemic it just took over there's nothing we could have done to stop it we tried we tried to lessen it but we kept losing them one after the other and I think the sign the sounds and the the noises they would make Will, will haunt me forever. Working in public childcare, it was always the needs of the children that came first. Where with private childcare, they make decisions for their financial, economic bottom line. They're not making decisions based on the children. The heart is not in the money. The heart is in the care. <laughs> we came together, a range of labor, community organizations, who felt that we had to show our solidarity with the people of Ottawa who have been under siege for the last three weeks, under siege by a convoy that was funded by the far right, that was organized by the far right, and that was